Off the responsibility of breaking things. That way, I have plausible deniability. you do? Yeah. So he shit and stuff and things. Is that what he did? No, it, the, projector turn, the projector was off. So that power? Oh, it was the wrong color light. Fans. Fans are, are oxygen when they're cooling. They should be fanned all the time. Right, but this, I think since the fan was on, Exactly. The, the power light was on and the projector fan was running, but the power light was orange and not green. Okay, we're looking for a meeting, a note taker. We'll wait for people to trickle in. Um, yeah, I know that dude. Anybody interested in taking notes? Uh, you don't have to be in the room. You can be in the room. Who wants to be a note taker? Note taking is an excellent opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> to now be, be part of the process. Anyone on online who wants to be a note taker? It will give you a great sense of uh, participation. You can, if you'd like to. You'd be more than welcome. Somebody else can do it when you're when you're up. You can. Does that sound like Eric? You're interested. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yes. Go to Meet Echo, and there is a note-taking tool. Um, yes. Try to, try to click on the video. All right, we'll try and find somebody. I got you. But I will, I won't leave you hanging. Let's see here. How about, uh, you take notes, I'll take notes while you're presenting? He's, he's, he said try to find somebody else. Uh, oh, overall. Uh, and and sure. use you as a backup. Hold on, I hold on a second. Let me see if there's one person. That, uh... Jake, um, would you have any interest in being the note taker? Sure, I can do that. And when you're up talking, uh, Eric so I, can take a, take the reins. All right, I don't. I mean, I think that's most of what I have. Uh, okay. Oh, excellent. All right, cool. So Even better. Yeah, yeah, we're good. good. Yeah. 
Okay, we'll wait another minute for people to come back from lunch. Um, switch to the, um, go back to the, I'm less familiar with that interface. Yeah, That's the that online like tool. Remote interface. Uh, do, the, do the remote one. Uh, I'm sorry. Click, click on the, um, it's the video. video link. From the agenda? Yeah. Video stream. And you should get an interface that looks like this. And then on that, the little box with the pencil sticking out, that's the video stream. Video stream. Cookie, quick, let's go. No, no, no. Show me what you got. Make sure it's right there. Right in the yep, you're good. And it's an online note taking thing, so you and Jake can work in tandem if he gets up. Okay, are we ready to get started? I'm about as ready as I can get. Okay. How's the room? You guys ready? All right. Look at that enthusiasm. The energy is just overwhelming. There we go. <laughs> we got one yeehaw. All right. So we're going to. Plow right through this food coma. Um, all right, we're going to start taking off for this flight. Um, so uh, here's the note well. Um, it should bear a striking resemblance to all the other note wells you've seen at the beginning of every meeting. Um, so uh, just please read it uh, and be aware of uh, what's the, the, what is noted well in participating. Um, Meeting tips, um, you know, for, for those uh, who are just arriving today uh, and haven't been in any of these uh, previous meetings, um, even if you're in the room, please do join the Meet Echo tool because that acts as the blue sheets. Um, and it also enables you to participate in chat and any polls that we have. Um, uh, just a reminder, please wear your masks unless you are actively speaking at the mic and you think that um, that can help uh, be a little more clear. Um, and remote participants, um, keep your audio and video off unless you are presenting. Um, here's today's agenda. Um, we have a action packed agenda. Um, let me know if we missed anything or if you'd like to bash this agenda. Otherwise, this is the plan. Actually, where's well, Warren was supposed to be here. Is Warren in here? Warren uh, with a W. Um, hmm. Okay. Yes, we, we miss Warren. All right. Um, yeah. Is there any other ops area meetings going on right now? Yeah, he must be a uh, DNS, DNS ops. I guess we, we know where he, we fall in his hierarchy of interests. Um, or he's still at lunch. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, status of working group docs. Um, Yang models uh, document. Um, Sandy, are you on? And Sandy, would you like to speak up uh, about um, any up? Do you have any updates or anything you'd like to say about the Yang models uh, draft? Sandy, are you there? I see you in the. Uh... Yeah. Okay, Sandy, let us know if you have uh, if you want to jump up. Um, the telemetry draft, uh, how, how you will be presenting on this, 
Um, and okay, yeah. So that's a, been a pretty consistent thing. So um, please do if you're interested. If you have interest in passions in in Yang, or even if you don't. Um, that's a draft that's been sitting for a while and needing uh, needing comments. So please speak up, uh, or so please take a look at it, review it, and um, reach out to the authors with any comments you might have. Uh, the redundant ingress failover draft. This has been adopted uh, since the last um, since Vienna. Uh, so that's a new working group document. Um, do we have any? authors, co-authors want to speak up and say, have anything to note about that draft, any updates, or uh, is it just the same as from uh, when it was originally submitted? Anyone? No, okay. Gotcha. Is Sandy a uh, co-author on that one? Are you a co-author on that one? Okay. Do you have any comments about that one? Here. I owe them a review. Okay. Um, Jake, uh, do you want to come up and give us an update on your um, multicast to the browser drafts, um, the dorms, AMBI, CBAC, and MNAT? I should note, uh, dorms just went working group last call. We've we've heard some comments. I would encourage others, please speak up on list uh, if you want to see this document um, advanced to IESG. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lonnie. This is Jake. Um, uh, so most of my time since. Uh, since 113, as I mentioned, there was on the uh, was on the quick work. Um, so I I did like do my own self review of dorms before uh, before poking you about last call, uh, and I think I think it's okay. So yeah, I'd love to see it go forward. Um, probably next on my list is MNAT, um, and uh, after a round of reviews, and I, I kind of because there's a dependency on dorms, I won't. Ambient C back, uh, you know, to to make sure that those are going to be uh, unimpacted by any feedback I get on dorms. Uh, but uh, I will want to get uh, reviews on those from security people and transport people, respectively, um, at some point. But uh, that'll be coming up soon. Uh, well, soonish, I hope. Maybe. Especially MNAT, I think there's been uh, a number of uh, of networks that wanted to use that, so I'll probably want to um, want to push that forward, uh, and then see back probably more than AMBI because for for the endpoint authentication, uh, Quick will also cover that. So AMBI might turn into just a sort of forwarding for the network, uh, which is. Still important, but probably not as important as the endpoint when I thought it was going to be using that. So, um, uh, yeah. So, these are still uh, still. I intend to to get them over the line one day. Um, thank you. Uh, talk about the clustering. Are, are all three oh, yeah, yeah, four yeah. being clustered, um, and do you have to cluster them at the same time? Like, how do we? Yeah. So I, I actually the asked the RC editors uh, this. Uh, earlier this week, so they get auto clustered apparently when they reach the um, if there's normative references between them uh, when they reach the RC editors queue. But I can also just send a note and ask them to uh, to the RC editors. So uh, I might I might do that. Uh, MNAT is not part of the same cluster. I, I just have a cluster, or I, I just wanted a cluster for dorms ambient back because they're um, they're all part of the same uh, protocol basically. All right. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so again, uh, we encourage uh, everybody to take a look at, um, speak up on dorms and take a look at uh, and, and review Ambient C back um, so we can work on advancing those as well soon. And those are all the active working group uh, documents. Um, so uh, we'll move on. So. Um, 
Warren was supposed to be here, and I believe uh, if I might steal his thunder, I think he was saying that his term as AD is expiring soon, and he wanted to encourage uh, others to uh, consider becoming an AD. Um, if you're interested in becoming an AD and uh, being his successor um, and have questions about that, please do reach out to him. Um, and if he does come in, we'll see if that's what he says. Um, so uh, next up is the telemetry draft. Uh, Hi, you. Okay. Yeah, this is how you song from Future Way. Today I'm going to give you a um, brief uh, updates and uh, recap of this uh, unpassed temp tree uh, using uh, IOM for multicast. Uh, on, behalf, on behalf of our co authors, next slide, please. So, first, uh, uh, updates of this new revision. Uh, we uh, actually several um, technologies uh, this document is based on have been uh, goes through the uh, uh, some of them has been published uh, as RFC and some of them is on, uh, in the last stage uh, for publication. So uh, now is a good time to make sure our uh, scheme is actually uh, comply with the existing uh, standards. Um, so, for example, um, uh, this technology, uh, th uh, this scheme is based on one of them is based on the IOM uh, trace option, uh, which already been specified in RFC uh, 9197, and uh, another uh, option scheme is based on the IOM direct export draft that will be published soon. Okay, next slide. Uh, first, uh, the problem we want to solve in this draft is uh, to apply the unpassed telemetry technologies in uh, for multicast. We think it's uh, useful uh, to monitor the multicast traffic. Um, so the so-called unpassed telemetry means we uh, insert the instruction and the telemetry data in user packet itself. Uh, in, so by doing that, we can collect the real-time uh, performance uh, and the experience of user traffic. And it's also very useful uh, in, uh, in terms of multicast. It can help us to reconstruct the uh, multicast tree from the data trees we collected. Um, but but uh, the issue about that is uh, if we um, just use IOM trees option, it will introduce a, a considerable data redundancy. Um, because uh, each destination node will uh, collect uh, the trees of the entire path. You can imagine uh, in, the, in this tree, uh, you know, many sections actually are overlapped uh, from the root to each node. But if you get the, all those data and all the uh, leaf nodes, that will, um, uh, there will be a lot of data redundancy. We want to avoid that. So we can have uh, two solutions to, do, uh, to, to solve this problem. The first one is still based on the IOM trace option. The second one is based on the IOM direct export option. Next slide, please. So the, for the trace option, uh, the trace option means we just uh, keep adding the telemetry data in the user packet on the forwarding path. So you can see this, uh, uh, this why it will introduce uh, a lot of redundancy data uh, in the multicast uh, tree. So the solution is we basically combine the IOM trace option and the postcard based telemetry. We, we don't try to collect the uh, data trees for the entire path. Actually, uh, at each um, branching node, we just uh, uh, configure the node to export the, the data we collected so far. Then we clear the trace, trace then, the, uh, on then on each branch, we can do the data collection again. 
Um, this option, uh, there's no need to update the RFC 9197. Uh, it only requires the data plane configuration. Next slide, please. So this is a figure to show the uh, show an example. You can see this uh, uh, multicast tree and to node B, there will be two uh, branches and node D, there will be three branches. Then we configure the node B and the D to let them know. And this point you need to um, just export the data collected so far, then we can clear the, um, the data part, then we can start over again uh, on each on each branches. And, uh, uh, but to reconstruct the uh, multicast tree, we do require that the node ID data is a mandatory that must be collected. And uh, uh, also, um, so each, uh, uh, each section's trees also need to include the branching node. Uh, for example, the, the node D it uh, explore the data must start from node B. So it covers the section B, C, and D in this example. Next slide. The second uh, uh, optional solution is uh, to, uh, to use the IOM DEX as a direct export uh, option. Um, so for this, uh, each packet only carry an instruction header to tell you what data to collect. And then uh, each node will uh, just uh, uh, send an independent um, uh, uh, postcard packet uh, to send the collected data to some uh, collectors. So uh, therefore, the, the, the data never goes with the user packet. So uh, there's, there will be no redundant data because each um, each node will only export the, its local data. But the issue here is that for in the case of a multicast, uh, uh, for the postcard mode, we need to correlate the postcard data. Uh, this is especially challenging for multicast because uh, we, we also need to identify uh, which branch uh, uh, this uh, data is uh, postcard data is com comes from. So uh, to solve that problem, we need a new data type. We call that um, branch uh, branch ID or branch identifier. Uh, solution: the, the branch identifier uh, it, uh, con combine uh, con uh, contains two parts. The first part is a node ID. Um, this is a identical as specified in RFC 9197. It used three, three bytes to hold the node ID. Then we use one more byte to hold the branch index. So if this is a local assigned index for each uh, output port of the multicast tree. Uh, so therefore uh, we can support up to 256 local branches. So by combining the node ID and the branch index, we can uniquely identify each branch uh, and to each branching node. Next slide, please. So uh, left side, you can sh show some uh, frame uh, format uh, of this uh, 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 direct export instruction header. Uh, we will need to uh, allocate a, a flag bit, uh, we call that M, uh, to indicate uh, th this uh, is uh, for the multicast um, use case. Uh, this, this, uh, so if the M bit is set to one, it means there will be an optional data field, the multicast branch ID included in the data part. Um, you can see there's a third um, optional part which include the branch ID we just uh, introduced. So with this such information, uh, it allow us to easily uh, reconstruct the multicast tree. Uh, on the right side, you can see an example. Uh, in the bracket, the, it, it just means the branch ID. You can see in the node A, the pro, pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, postcard uh, send packet uh, includes the A0 as a node ID. 
branch ID and uh, uh, and followed with uh, um, telemetry data collected at node A. And at node B, it again, it sends the branch ID A0, uh, then the local data collected. But you can see in the following node, uh, there are two branches. The upper branch will be the branch identified B0, and the lower branch will have the uh, branch ID B1. So with this uh, information, it uh, allow us to easily um, identify how the, where this uh, uh, postcard comes from. Then we can easily reconstruct the multicast tree. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a brief introduction about this. And uh, uh, so far we think this document is already uh, pretty mature and therefore uh, we ask the working uh, group to consider the working group last call for it. Thank you. Any questions? I think you can just you can just walk up there. <laughs> it's a small enough room we can we can manage. Yeah, Jay Collin. Um, uh, do you have any implementation status to to share on on this work? It looks pretty good, I I think. Uh, 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 we don't have an implementation for this multicast yet, but uh, uh, we do have a. Uh, implementation for the IOM uh, in general. And is that in, in what, the open daylight or in? Uh... Uh, it's in, a, I think in the product, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, great, thank you. And um, what was the other? Uh, I, I haven't looked at the latest version of the draft. Do you talk about um, uh, the index stability when when interfaces uh, come up and down, like when new interfaces are added, mm -hmm. and and is it relative to the current fan out tree or to the interfaces that are available, or like how are the how are the local inter, uh, index indices assigned? If you could speak to that a little bit, or just tell me to read the draft if it's all spelled out there. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're talking about the interface uh, up and down. It, so the uh, the branch ID, as I understood yeah, it, in the yeah. DEX version, is a local interface identifier of some sort. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we we okay. locally assign uh, ID for each interface, so we can use, just use the one byte value attached to the node ID to identify the okay. unique branch. Yeah. And then as it changes uh, while while flows are in progress, um, are you specking out? how the how the IDs change, or how to re-aggregate those? In Basically. The I, I, I expect that it can be static because uh, okay. it doesn't matter. The only use of it is to help us to reconstruct the multicast tree. So because we also have the node ID in it. So as long as we can distinguish the different branches. That's a, okay, so you see this as a, as a static assignment on the interface, yes, essentially. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Static, yeah. <clears throat> Niels Warnke, Deutsche Telekom. Um, basically, uh, Jake, you, uh, you, you asked half of my question as well. Um, so when I was looking at the data scheme that you provided, I think two or three slides back, <clears throat> um, my question is, are you actually distinguishing which interface receives or sends the multicast uh, on the node? Or is this purely a monitoring of, of the node ID as such? It's, uh... You know, the, the node ID data is already available to yes. be included. So, but if we think about, think about the multicast case, uh, if there's no branch ID, then for example, the next node from the, uh, uh, from the branching point, yes. uh, you will, you, they both send a postcard packet, then yes. you, will, you will not know, you, can, you cannot tell if, the, uh, if they are, belong to the different branches or correct so, so with that information you can tell yeah. so so rephrasing my question mm -hmm. i have 2000 multicast streams in my network 
and I have um, a, a router, a, a P router in my network, which has 350 multicast activated interfaces. Okay. How many postcards will I receive? Oh, uh, so it, yeah, each, each tree might, you, you might be able to aggregate that explore data, but uh, it's easy to distinguish the different multicast tree because in addition to this, uh, a branch ID, we also have the flow ID and uh, uh, I forgot in the, the, in the figure, we have some other information to tell you which flow it belongs to. So you can easily attribute the uh, data to different multicast tree. You, that, they, they will not mix together. So the, um, Danny, could you go back one or two slides, please? Um, Excuse me? No, L Lenny. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, oh, next, this next one, one exactly. Yeah, flow ID so, and a sequence number. Yeah, flow ID basically tell uh, tell you it's a unique number and tell you the. That, that's a multicast stream, right? Yeah, yeah. The the S comma G. Okay. Sequence number tell you the order of this mm -hmm. uh, this packet. And uh, where in this information do I find the interface to reconstruct the tree? Mm -hmm. Or is this not included in the postcard? Is, is, this is a come from the every packet, then then uh, and uh, and each uh, each node will um, assign that uh, writes that part. That's the multicast branch ID, because uh, I just use, need to use that information to tell uh, to reconstruct the, the tree. Uh, okay, so the flow ID is 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 respect uh, is, is is corresponding to the multicast group. Oh yeah, flow ID never changed. Yeah. It's the start from the source, and yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and also the sequence number never and, changed. Yeah. And the multicast branch ID reflects then the interface ID. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so back to my original scaling. If you have 350 uh, interfaces, you would receive 350 postcards from one router, right? One router, I said, uh, based on the current scheme, is support up to 256 um, different branches. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. so that was exactly where I was pointing at. Mm -hmm. So um, 256, I don't know, for a large IP TV, that is already narrow. Huh? Uh, on, on our P routers, for example, we have more than that. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's it's a good start and a good approach. What, what I would like just like to point out is that the um, that the interface is really key and needs to be included in, in, in this postcard because otherwise you, f you will have hard time because of the sheer amount of postcards that you will yeah, receive. Yeah. So, so you think that uh, eight bits is uh, too, too, too few? Uh, you, uh... Um, I can only say for us it wouldn't be enough, but I mm -hmm. don't know if, um, if this is really representative of uh, ITF. Uh, or operators, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dino? Um, this is Dino. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say I support the idea of wanting to solve multicast telemetry. At the Olympics, uh, they want um, um, the, um, the U.S. broadcaster wants to uh, look at data on the tree, both downstream and upstream. And what we did in Tokyo is we used um, the LISP control plane to, to find out um, things like uh, RTT times on each branch, uh, one-way hop count, forward and reverse, latency forward and reverse. Um, and uh, the advantage we had with doing it with an overlay is that we didn't have to touch the underlay routes at all. And we were still able to get that granularity of information. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking maybe I'll present that next time at, at the next MOND if you want. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, I definitely for solving this problem. All right. So um, just a quick show of hands. Uh, who has read this draft thus far? Yeah. Uh, use, if you could use the tool. Uh, the, the, the poll, the question to the crowd, crowd is who has actually, who has actually read the draft? Uh, you can. Yeah, it's a short draft. Can finish the very um, soon. I will 
The most important thing, are the, if you have, please raise your hand. Uh, if you haven't, you can either abstain or not raise your hand. We can do the math. All right, so um, it sounds like there's a lot of interest. Uh, just needing more folks to read the draft, so please do, uh, please do take a look. All right, thank you. Okay, Jake, you're up. Or no, I'm sorry, Max. Yep. Max, you're up. There we go. Um, the call is still up. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Max from TU Berlin, and I'm presenting um, the multicast quick extension. Yeah, uh, Jake presented it already at uh, Quick just before lunch, and now I'm going to present it to you. Um, so let's start with the basic idea. Next slide. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is that we still want to get multicast into the browser, basically, and we're looking for ways to do that. And since browsers have uh, quick implementations, we thought one way to do that would be to use those quick implementations to find a way to get multicast into that. Um, so what this extension does, it basically uses a quick unicast connection as a sort of anchor or side channel um, from where the client starts. And um, it can say, the client can say, I support multicast. Um, and these are my limits, basically. Like this is my, my maximum maximum supported um, rate, etc. And then the the server could tell the client over the unicast connection um, some multicast channels, basically, and tell the client to join these multicast channels to receive data. So it's server driven. The server picks which SSM we only support SSM uh, channels the client should join. The client can then decide, okay, I'm gonna try to join these SSM channels. And on these SSM channels, the client will find quick frames, quick packets, um, which contain data, basically. Um, if the client is unable to join these channels, the server could then decide to also send the data over the regular unicast connection which means that the client, um, so, so no matter if multicast is supported or not, the client would still get the data. The idea is also that it's transparent to the overlying applications. Um, of course, they would have to set a flag to support multicast because obviously for some applications they don't want multicast, but um, from that point on, it would just see normal um, quick data arrive basically on the connection. Okay, so what Quick also gives us is a way to um, encrypt and use incre integrity. So each packet, no matter if it's sent on the multicast channel or the regular connection is encrypted. Um, obviously the issue is that every receiver gets the same packet uh, over the multicast channel. So it's not a high bar to decrypt because the key is sent to everyone, the same key. Um, so that alone isn't enough to, to um, guarantee integrity. So we also send integrity frames, which are basically um, hashes for each packet that um, guarantee that when the when the receiver sees a packet over the multicast, it knows that it's um, a valid packet. Uh, right. So um, the the client also acts the packet it receives the packets it receives over the multicast channels over unicast, so the server knows which packets arrive, which packets get lost. So in that way, we have um, reliability. And um, the flow control and congestion control are obviously different. So the, as I said before, the client sets its own limits. And the, that's the way congestion control is done. Uh, of course, the server could also do 
something if it sees that a lot of packets get dropped because it doesn't receive the X, then it could also tell the, the client to leave some channels. Um, right, it only works from server to client, so obviously the, the, the client can't send multicast. And um, Dino, sure. Yeah, I just want to ask a clarification yeah. question, and, and it, it only requires a yes or no answer, I think. Uh, but could I change the terminology just so we're on the same page? When you say server, we mean source. When you say source, client, yes. we mean receiver joining the group. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay, right. great. Right. So what if I'm a re you're a source and I'm a receiver? What if I want to join the group, but you haven't opened the unicast connection to me? That means I can't join it. Is that true? So you have, you have control the source of who joins. Is that kind of the architecture? Well, you don't have control of who joins, right? Anybody could join the send an IGMP. You're still underlying that you still send. Will they get the data if they do that? They will get the data, but they can't necessarily decrypt it or um, check the integrity. So it's, it's not useful then? Well, but again, the, the, the key is shared with everyone, right? So like a bad actor could no, give the it, key. No, it's, okay. it's fine. I just okay. want to know what the trade-offs were in the architecture. Yeah. And so that, that means you're actually putting some access control. This is really a source initiated multicast communication yes. and the source really has control of who joins the group. Yes. Okay, Attention. sounds yeah. good. Okay. I, I, well, yeah. I'm not, I shouldn't have said sounds good, but okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, right, as I said, the, 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 the packets arriving over multicast are uh, for the application, they, they don't differentiate. Yes, Jake? Yeah, again, just to clarify, the from a multicast channel perspective, you're right, there's a source and, and a receiver. But uh, since this is like maintained in as part of a quick connection, it's uh, this is why we chose the terminology server and client. In it's in the quick context that we have a server and a client. Uh, and, and in that context, it's sort of incidental that they happen to also be source and receiver for multicast. They don't have to be. I mean, a source could be a multicast source could be somewhere else, and you control by the server with unicast quick connection. Uh, please repeat the question on the mic, if you you, you can, or Jake, just repeat his question for him. That was a really interesting comment. So, can you have the server do the unicast control plane with the receivers, and the source be some other node on the network? Yes, that's uh, that's going to be common we we expect for truly scalable solutions yeah because you're going to need to anchor it with a unicast connection yeah kyle rose i mean the i think the one of the important things about this about this uh this proposal is that it's it's not um it's not a general multicast mechanism it's intended specifically for the case in which you already have you have a relationship with a with a quick server and we're just providing an alternate means for transmitting data that might be shared among many different clients. So, so you don't have to unicast replicate over the unicast quick channels. Okay. Now another thing. That's correct. Okay. So another thing I thought about, it might be hard for me to join the group because since the control channel tells me what the S comma G is, I may not know it. I could guess it, but I may not know it. So it would be hard for me to join, receive un un encrypted data that I can't decrypt. Is that, you agree with that? Okay. Yes. Welcome, Sandy, with the mic. Uh, Jeffrey. Oh, that's Jeffrey. Yeah, I was just saying. Uh, Stig, does Jeffrey go behind you? Uh, yeah, all right, okay. Um, yeah, Stig Venas. So this sounds pretty cool. Um, just one thought I had is in, in the beer worker group, they are looking at stuff where a source can send to certain clients without the client having to join first. So it's really the membership is driven all by the source. And they're looking into doing, using it for HTTP, HTTP in some cases. So, so I think this could fit well within that. But of course, beer is not that used, uh, much used yet. So <laughs> you want to sell it for multicast in general. Thank you. Jeffrey from Juniper. Clients X, uh, X each packet over unicast. Let's say you have 10,000 clients and how does that scale? Well, it, um, 
Right. It, it, it scales better than having 10,000 clients receiving the, the data over Unicast altogether, right? I mean, you're going to have to, we, we, are think, we were thinking about not always hacking stuff, right? And you can use, but yeah, it would be somewhat a violation of quick. Yeah, so in, in some sense, it still scales linearly, but the constant is a lot lower. Is it fair to say the control plane is scaling the same, but it's the, the actual data packets are where you're getting the benefits of multicast? Right, and, and, and because of the way that Quick handles acts, it's probably sublinear anyway, um, just assuming that you're not losing a lot of packets, but... Um... Yeah, I think it, this is one of those things where like we have ideas about how this is going to behave, but we're not really going to know until it's in practice and we're experimenting with it. So, but I mean, you know, we're open to, to you know, uh, helpful analysis from other people as well or thoughts on how this might work out. Yeah, I actually don't know much about Quick, so my question should be down, but I guess uh, the one difference between this and uh, 10,000 uh, uh, separate uh, uh, Unicast uh, sessions or the differences there is that those 10,000 different uh, sessions, they are separate ones. And here, this is one, this, all these acts are for the same session. Maybe it's not a problem, maybe it is, I just don't know. Stick uh, up. Yeah, stick with us. Um, maybe a stupid question, I don't know quick really, but, but do you have to act like send an ACK packet for each packet you ACK, or can you just ACK a lot of packets in one one message? Can you... Jake, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can ACK one in many, but uh, to come back to the general scaling questions, uh, uh, I would draw an analogy to NORM, uh, the existing uh, NAC-oriented reliable multicast uh, spec. So this one talks about a single server scaling only in the tens of thousands uh, for, for the reasons you were talking about. But we think we can distribute this over multiple servers in the same way we do uh, other kinds of uh, unicast distribution things. They'll have to be linked in some way because they all have to be able to handle X for the, for the multicast data. But uh, that, that's the intent for how to scale it. And it should be compared to quick unicast, not compared to like, Flute, for example, for you know receiver agnostic. Uh, one thing that might be on the table if we get some deployment and sort of operational experience with this would be adding NAC frames to Quick if it turns out to be actually useful. But uh, that's not part of this spec at this time. Also, like FEC frames, if it turns out to be useful, and maybe we can do more aggregation of NACs or, of, of the AX or NACs or something. But right now, we're trying to be as vanilla as we can in a Quick context. So I have a bunch of detailed questions. I want to let you finish your presentation. But actually, I think Jake answered half of the things, the broad statement I want to make. Have you guys looked at Norm? The answer is yes. Looks like you looked at Nax. Because I was going to say, did you look at the early um, Van Jacobson work and the work that the uh, Cisco's the guys did in the 90s on PGM, pretty good multicast? These are all various forms of reliable multicast transports. And the questions about retrans. The high level questions about retransmissions, repair neighborhoods, all that stuff. Are you trying to do that, avoid that? And, and you kind of said some of that, but I'll let you finish your presentation so I see how it works. Um, yeah, so speaking of retransmits, the retransmits could happen both. So you could have quick datagrams where you don't have retransmits. But if you have stream frames, um, the retransmit could happen over both multicast if enough um, clients or receivers lose the packet, right? Or you could um, individually retransmit them over the unicast channel as well. Is it okay if I ask questions? Sure. Or do you want to continue the presentation? I don't want to. Yeah. What, what, what do you, you recommend? Guys, you guys do you think um, Do you think you want to finish the presentation and then take questions, or is yeah. this helpful? Because then we'll be I, I, we'll be educated more after you do it. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, let's Let's finish quickly then. Um, yeah. Next slide. Then. And and just a, just a note. Uh, Gory mentioned on the uh, chat that Quick does not need to act every packet. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, right, that's the, the problems we solve. Um, but yes, as I said already, we want to get it into the browser. Um, we're gonna have encrypt, like uh, encryption for the packets. 
we have integrity checks like MB uh, uses as Jake said, so MB is in, yeah. Um, right. Um, okay, I think I said most of that already. Um, right. The scalability is in the data and not the control plane. Yeah, okay. Um, right, the current state of the draft, we already on version three. We had some reviews internally and from Lucas and from um, Kyle. And the, for us, at least, the current structure seems clear um, and the architecture. And we don't see any reasons that make it like impossible to actually get it deployed and use it and or things that are in violation of the uh, security draft for multicast. Um, so we got some feedback from the quick working group. Jake, do you wanna? Yeah, I mean, uh, there weren't many people who commented. Uh, Lars had some positive things to say. I think Alex uh, questioned whether it should happen in quick. Um, you know, I think that can be discussed on the mailing list. Uh, Martin Duke said he was he found it technically interesting and would be doing a review. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, I, I I expect that a lot of the people in Quick remain skeptical. Some of the offline comments I've had say uh, that uh, that there's some skepticism that we will adequately solve the sort of origin security model for uh, for for counting as non-mixed content in browsers. Um, I would like to dig in more on that claim uh, with with people who believe it. Um, probably not in this forum, but uh, uh, this is, we're trying to address that with the multicast security considerations. And we think that, so my opinion is that I think it can be addressed, but uh, there are some some differences. I think that they are minimal enough that they can be addressed, especially if we consider things like, uh, so Apple talked about uh, how they, they sort of treat a join of a multicast group as a, uh, under the same rubric as sort of local discovery things as a potential privacy uh, uh, exposure that requires a user input. So this kind of thing, I think, if it becomes more normalized, can contribute to protecting users against uh, inappropriate privacy violations, and could. And I think that that's the main difference uh, in terms of security. Um, although I, I'm not sure that I that I've fully captured everyone's objections to it, or that they fully thought it through, honestly, because a lot of them, I would say, maybe don't really want want to think about it too hard yet. Uh, I think that will change if we can manage to get a decent deployment that does something, but it's going to not be in a browser first. It's going to have to be like in a fat client that's launched from a browser if it's going to address uh, web video, for example. But but we would like to do that in our, you know, with our demo. Yeah, that's kind of where we're headed first, and then one day maybe into a browser. Uh, sure. So this is Dino. So I'm getting a really strong gut feeling that this is a really good architecture. I just, there's all these positive vibes going through my mind. So I think I'm really happy. And I'll explain why you so solved the source discovery problem because it's done at the source. That's really good. Um, the fact that you're mixing unicast and multicast means if you wanted the unicast connections to go on an underlay and you wanted multicast to go on an overlay, this could happen with this architecture. That's really cool, at least for me, because I'm an overlay guy these days. Um, now I have a detailed question. Um, so in PGM, there was NACs that came from the receivers when they saw a packet out of sequence. And the routers inter intermediate would build these lost neighborhoods. So when the packet was retransmitted, it would only go to the lost neighborhoods and not to the receivers that received it. So can you explain, I, I realize that if you want to retransmit a multicast packet that has been lost somewhere on some branch somewhere that you could, you, you may not be able to, you may or may not be able to identify where it was lost and you could certainly retransmit on the unicast channels, which could be inefficient if the lost neighborhood was really large, right? Um, so that's my question. What are you guys thinking about how to do this? And are, do you just retransmit on multicast and let the guys who got it drop the duplicates or because there's we, we did a lot of research with this on PGM 
and we thought that the NAC neighborhood and having routers store state about lost messages was worthwhile. It turned out to be complicated and maybe an over-optimization. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're not sure exactly how to do it yet. I think that's like one of the things. Yeah, the I operation. would say we're, we're not sure, but in terms of the architecture and the document, this would be a server implementation decision. So it's not gonna be routers, I'll tell you that much. It's gonna be endpoints. So it's gonna be a server endpoint. And in a deployment model, we would expect probably to have uh, you know, servers co-located in a network and to maybe, like I'm not gonna give you this on the first pass, but one day if this takes off, yeah, we'll have servers that are sort of dedicated to a particular network. And when there's loss that's correlated across that network, I would expect the servers to you know, as an optimization to prefer to retransmit over multicast for that network. And if there was anybody who got it, they would be able as a natural part of quick to discard uh, repeats. That shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But you know, that's, that's sort of optimization for later. Yeah. So what, it, what ended up happening in PGM is that we didn't want to have this router assist NAC thing. And so PGM turned out to be a reliable transport. And what happened was we, when there was any NAC that came back, the ret it retransmitted down the tree. And what Jake just said is the, the receivers who got it just threw it away. It was much simpler and it was more um, end to end. So having said that, since this is really a reliable transport protocol, it should probably be done in the transport area. But the problem there is, is everybody hates multicast there. So we need good representation to do it. So, you know, so maybe you teach us transport or we teach them multicast. I don't know you, <laughs> but. Oh, okay, got it. So the plan is to do it in the quick working group. Okay, got it. Um, wh why don't you just finish? You got two slides, and then yeah. and then we'll open up for questions. So, um, yeah, yeah. The, the, so the, the the last two slides are basically about our implementation. Um, so we implemented, started to implement it um, in Chromium, and we got all the uh, we got the frames, the new frames, and we got the the transfer parameter and so on. Um, the thing we're missing there is how to get, feed the packets we receive over multicast into the event loop of the regular quick connection, basically. Um, and that's a bit tricky in Chromium. So now we are thinking about for the first um, demo to instead use something like um, AIO quick or something in Python, where it's much simpler to just feed the packets in and you don't have all the overhead of, of Chromium. Of course, the goal is to get it into a browser. So eventually we will do it, hopefully, in Chromium but just for the first test like that. Um, yeah, also there were some issues with web transport, but I think we're just gonna skip over those for now um, and rather have the more multicast focused discussion, right? And that's it. Yeah, Niels, uh, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, first of all, uh, Kundos for uh, doing the work, and uh, I think you've got a really good approach here. Um, in matter of transparency, I already provided all, um, some of the points to Jake offline. Um, I think what would be interesting is to, to couple this also, not just to a native multicast, but also to AMT, um, so that you have the opportunity to say, I, I will try first uh, to, to join a multicast group once once it's already set up and then you try uh, if there's an AMT relay, which is still better than uh, unicasting it all the way. Uh, um, the other option or the other point that came into my mind is regarding retransmission. Uh, maybe you should rethink about this because if this is uh, fundamentally for live events, from my, uh, so, so live TV, uh, like Super Bowl or whatever. Now, from our experience, um, there's only a really tiny time frame where you have the buffering and where it really makes sense to retransmit the data packets. Um, in most of the cases, especially if you're further away from those retransmission servers, um, talking about 50, 60 milliseconds typically, um, then retransmission doesn't make sense. And then you don't have to actually think about retransmission. If, you, if you're talking about, and this was another use case, uh, downloading files via multicast, so large downloads, et cetera, then of course it makes sense. Then you need those packages. But um, I think it's more to focus on what is really required for which you can use case. Yeah. 
Right. Um, so we uh, support both quick stream and quick datagrams. So the, if you use datagrams to send the data, you wouldn't get retransmits, right? So the application or the sender could choose which uh, whether to use datagrams or stream frames. Okay. But yeah, Jake. Do you want to reply for that? Sure. To also respond to that, we've been looking at like some of the mock work, the media over quick. We think that there's good synergy with the push approaches they're using, using there for rush and warp. Um, and possibly for the R quick stuff that, or the quick R stuff that they're talking about. Um, and the idea is that as long as you're using server initiated streams, uh, the whole stream uh, has retransmits sort of built in, but you can still reset the stream and then that stream can be dropped. So you can have unreliable transmission at the sort of level of a frame or a segment uh, if, it, if it times out. There, some of the work that they're doing there we think will mesh well with this approach that we have here is basically the point. So I'd encourage you to read that uh, to, to see if, if we need to do more than that, what that's doing. Thanks. And um, the last remark uh, to the acknowledgments, um, I think from a scaling perspective, especially if you scale up to those uh, volumes that you have in mind uh, or that you're wishing for, um, I think something like the TCP window size where you only re uh, acknowledge uh, certain uh, packet windows uh, could, could actually ease up your life. So, so we actually have a mechanic for um, bundling X, right? Where you wait for a time where like, like you don't have to act immediately, but you can wait like a server set timeout before you have to like say, okay, I act now, right? So we have that because yeah, in, in quick, especially the the egging is worse than in TCP, I think just from the overhead. Yeah, Dino? Uh, this is Dino. Um, regarding the comment you just made about live and retransmissions, I would just say uh, don't, have an option never to retransmit and for live events use FEC because FEC will correct most errors in real time. And um, just as a data point, um, Solana, the Solana blockchain uses FEC and UDP transmission. That blockchain does not use a reliable transport protocol and it's working really well. And this is over like uh, tens of thousands of nodes. Which FEC do they use? I don't know. I'll, I, I can let you know, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Is it open source or is it some project? It's absolutely open source. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then my other question was, is um, you seem to, dis I don't think you're restricting it to one to many, but you described it as one to many. If you were wanted to have a whiteboard session with um, 100 people drawing on a whiteboard, would this just be multiple instances of one to many, or is there any provision to do many to many, uh, in any specific way um, i mean you need the the unicast connection right so you would have to have like a central anchor point where uh, okay so if you have uh one dimension you will have n squared unicast connections and that yeah. that's a concern that jeffrey right, made right, yeah. about okay Those there, there's no way around be... it by just throwing you say throw resources at it and Dino, just going back trying to understand your, your use case there uh, like 100 whiteboard sessions those would be like each one would be a multicast session. Uh, I, w I meant 100 participants in one whiteboard session. But they're all writing on it. Yes, they're so all they're all sourcing. They're all sourcing. They're all multicast sources. So, so, so uh, that could be an application solution where they just go to the source and then it goes down on a single tree. Well, or... that's the way Zoom works today, and it's not decentralized, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, this could provide decentralized solutions, right? So, okay, thanks. All right. Uh, one last question. Question: um, uh, the, the the this mixing of um, uh, multicast and unicast um, does that uh, does that um, imply that if you wanted to do something like uh, unicast bespoke advertising with a multicast stream, uh, you know this 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 would work well, or um, you know being able to mix in unicast stuff and multicast stuff sure the server could certainly decide if it wants to like send something specifically to that client over unicast that isn't supposed to be received by everybody else cool. all right thank you thank you max this is great so next up yeah um i'm going to un maybe yes you. Okay, so next up is Lauren. She's been working on the um, 
Uh, we, we, we've been speaking for the last few IETFs about, um, about the work she's been doing and um, it's culminated with off-net sourcing and uh, some recent enhancements with the multicast menu. Yeah, and um, as soon as my slides come up, it would. It is slowly coming up. Yeah, so I wanna start by just talking through the stuff, um, the two and a half components I have, and then hopefully we'll try some live demos and see how that goes. Um, I saw the homework went out on the mailing list, but if anyone wants to download VLC4 that hasn't already um, and participate in the live demos, if you go to uh, treatyend.net, there's a link on the top of the page for VLC4. Um, uh, if there's anybody at Meet, Meet Echo, um, we're having a little trouble doing a screen share. Maybe. I requested. Oh, do I really want to share my screen? Yes, I do. I All would right. like to share my. Never mind, Meet Echo. We're good. Entire screen. And allow. There's a inception mode. There we go. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, off net sourcing and the multicast menu. Like I said, I have two and a half components. Multicast menu and the off net sourcing bit are the main stuff. And then I just want to talk about TJTV because I think it's a cool example of lowering the barrier of entry to streaming multicast. Um, so multicast menu started off looking like this and the main benefits of it um, were it lets you register and or add your multicast streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, better? There we go, okay. Um, so let's you register and, and or add your multicast stream. So if you've got a multicast enabled network and you are putting your own stream out there, you can either manually report it, so typing in source, group, UDP port, and a description of it, or let multicast menu itself just kind of pick it up. Every night it goes through internet two and Giant to look for multicast streams. Essentially it's just hitting the looking glasses and running show multicast route detail. Um, to pick up any streams that are going through there. Alternatively, and this is where the off-net sourcing bit comes in, if you're not on a multicast enabled network, you can upload a file, like a video file, and have it translated. Um, and there's an API to do this all programmatically. Of course, you need a way to ma uh, manage what you've added. So changing like the stream information, title, description, category, um, and then also it's very easy to view the streams. Um, it's much easier than, it, it's much more simple than the command line options that have been there in the past. We'd kind of have a direct option to open in VLC. Um, we're still working on specifying that a the AMT relay option when opening directly into VLC um, and verifying that the manual streams that are reported are actually, actually exist. We do basic like, did you give an, an actual IPv4 address? But not really anything beyond that at this point. Um, and then a protocol handler from op for opening directly from the browser would be nice. Um, and then a student at TU Berlin um, recently kind of redid the UI, uh, made it look a lot better. <laughs> so we've got a thumbnail for each screen now, like I said, UI overhaul, and also the ability to sort streams uh, by categories, liked, trending, editor's choice, and various genres. So the second component is off-net sourcing. So this is accomplished from a phone, um, and the phone jumps through a, uh, a transport translator, which sends it to the multicast translator. So in words, um, so we're going from the sender and receiver from your phone, an app on your phone, to transport translator, sending it over UDP to into the multicast translator. And that's where it actually enters a multicast enabled network for the first time. And then that multicast translator is obviously translating to multicast. Still working on various video encodings. And then the hope is eventually that this multicast live or this off-net sourcing app can also become an off-net receiving app. So you have some sort of AMT gateway implementation in the app and then doing it for iOS as opposed to just Android. And then before we jump into demos, I just wanted to highlight TJTV. Um, my old high school uh, is one of the ones running an AMT relay and 
it's just very easy to, if you have access to a multicast enabled network, set up um, streams. I've just got VLC sending them to the AMT relay. And actually the first demo is uh, watching one of those streams. So for the demo, this is the kind of topology that we're working with, multicast translator, AMT relay, in the box sending that TJTV are all on a multicast enabled network. Um, and then the rest of the stuff isn't. We have our three imaginary people in blue um, and all of the stuff in green is infrastructure that actually exists. So I'm gonna jump out of presentation mode and split my screen um, because I want to also see the, the terminal over there that's showing what's happening in the background. Um, so the first demo is just viewing um, the TJTV streams at all. So going into multicast menu, oh yeah, that TV is behind. Okay, so going into multicast menu, finding a stream you're interested in watching and opening it directly from VLC, saving, placing. Um, it's just opening in VLC. So this is designed to simplify for an end user that might not know how to use a command line. Um, we've got a stream, I have my laptop muted right now, but the audio comes through as well. So the flow, or the flow that happened there was um, before any of this, I added, go back into full screen. I added the streams to TJTV and I manually added an entry to multicast menu to tell you about the streams. And then we went from our laptop to multicast menu to get the information about the streams. And then we reached out to the AMT relay because here at IATF we're sitting on a multi, uh, unicast only network and the AMT relay was able to provide that TG, TJ TV source for us. Okay, here's where things get interesting. So um, this is the off net sourcing bit. And this is the first of the two off net sourcing capabilities where we're streaming from a file, so a pre recorded video. Um, if I didn't have access to a multicast enabled network, I could have done TJTV this way, just uploading the video. So going to multicast menu, add stream, and uploading a file, um, specifying some basic stream information to help people know what it is and then selecting our file. And as soon as I hit submit here, it's gonna buffer for a second. Um, but when it goes through, you'll see that uh, the translator is now receiving a, a UDP source in and it's translating it as multicast. It picked a multicast group address for it and then it uh, pinged multicast menus API to add it. And when we refresh the page here, we see that our video has picked up the source, our video and multicast menu has picked up the source in the group that was assigned to it. So if we go back over into the main page, we can again go through the process of opening in VLC. And this one takes us a couple seconds to load up, I've noticed. Um, should pop up. There we go. And we have our source that is streaming from multicast menu that I just uploaded. Okay, um, so the flow that happened for that one was that we, um, from our computer, we uploaded a file to multicast menu. Multicast menu sent that to the multicast translator to be translated um, as multicast and then sent an API back to multicast menu to tell us about it. And then that same flow that happened before when we tried to view it. So the third and final demo and the one that I think is pretty cool is let's live stream this meeting. So we're not actually gonna open the, the app because the video encoding is still messed up. Um, but on my phone, I have an app, it's called Hiya Vision Live. And is there a camera that shows? Anyway, it's on my phone, it's called Hiya Vision Live. And all I did was type in the URL of this transport translator, and I'm going to start a stream and I'll, I'll prop it up. I can hold it. Yeah, there you go. Be a there you go, we got a cameraman. Okay, so. Oh, I broke it. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Hopefully that. Okay. So we see that we have a second uh, message here from our translator. Actually, before we do that, um, you see that we accepted an SRT source connection. That's what's coming from the phone. That's that first hop into the transport translator. And then we're forwarding on to our multicast translator to add to multicast menu. Um, and we see we have this first item here, which is what we just added. There's no description available because we haven't added one yet, but there is the ability to crowdsource such a description. Um, but if we want to open this in VLC, it's a lot of clicking to open in VLC, which is why we'd like to get that protocol handler um, to do it a little easier. But it does beat the command line for many, many users. Okay. There we go. And so now we're streaming. And like I said, audio comes through just fine. Um, I just have my computer mu muted at the moment. But yeah. So most of this, uh, let me get my slides back. Yes. Um, and like I said, the goal is to get to a separate like multicast live app where it can be both a sender and receiver. But in the interim, High Vision Live, Android and iOS does the job perfectly fine. Yeah. So just for those, you know, not following along, what, um, what uh, Lauren's essentially built here is something that IETF hasn't done in about 15 to 20 years, which is stream a, a, uh, an IETF uh, over the M bone. Um, and better yet, it can be received by anybody on uh, Unicast only network. So, um, so we're getting IETF back in, uh, 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 over being multicasted. Um, and uh, yes, and not only <laughs> is it being multicasted, but it's being received by, it's being transported via multicast, but received by anybody on the internet, uh, including Unicast only, which is something that, uh, you know, even 20 years ago, we couldn't do when, multi when these meetings were multicasted. Yeah, with AMT. So the, I stopped the stream, so okay. you can stop being cameraman. Right. Um, and the part I didn't address is that the, yeah, if you hit stop stream, um, that all of the, the teardown is very automatic. So when it stops receiving uh, translation here, it'll call back to multicast menu and say, hey, I'm not getting a source anymore. Please delete the entry. So people aren't looking up stale sources. Um, and for that last, the flow for that last was from a phone into our transport translator was just, just an AWS box sitting on the unicast regular internet. Um, then into multicast, into the multicast translator, back out um, as an API call. Yeah, so most of this is still pretty actively being developed. Um, like I, I had to do's on each slide. So we're building up little by little, trying to pick and pull different uh, bits of technology to push them all together to make this work. That's what I've got. Um, um, Ma Max. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Max uh, followed, to get the few yeah, he followed to instructions. Uh, I, I just had a question about other source options. I mean, first of all, fantastic. This is, this is very exciting. Uh, if, if I had something like an existing uh, IP camera, can we pull that uh, that stream as well? Somehow set it as a destination into the translator and get that sourced? Yeah, so that's not built in as like a easy clickable thing in multicast menu, but it's certainly very possible, yes. Uh, yes, Max Franke, um, great presentation, thanks. Um, clarifying question, I guess. So the app, the Higher TV app sends it via unicast to the multicast translator? Right? Yeah, yeah, so I've still got my slides, right? Yep. Okay, um, yeah, so what's actually happening is it's sending, the High Vision app is using SRT, which is uh, UDP based, uh, but still has some server client aspects. Um, and that's going into a transport, transport translator, which is just taking that SRT UDP and changing it to regular UDP. And that's what's going into the multicast translator. Okay, and, and then the multicast translator sends it out both via multicast the, it translates to multicast and from the okay. All right. Exactly. It All takes right. UDP, unicast, and right. out as multicast. Thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, to 
thank you for this presentation and say that I think this is the first time I've ever seen a live demo at IETF go down without a hitch. So really good job. That was fantastic. I was very concerned. Hi, I'm Jake. Uh, when you say regular UDP, you mean raw TS encoded uh, inside the UDP, right? This is MPEG TS. That's yes, like, it's okay. MPEG TS. Yes. Great, thanks. Uh, great job, Lauren. Um, I just wanted to share some experience that uh, I've seen not working because. Uh, um, I used to work for a consulting company and uh, we were doing some consulting work at a large international um, insurance company and they tried to live stream pretty much exactly in the same way that you did their um, um, all hands calls for uh, the employees on site multicast off site uh, through unicast. Um, what you've done works, what they've done failed, and they had to reschedule the session. <laughs> yeah, scalability is still a, a slight issue, more just because of like operational constraints. You've got a tiny AWS box and IP tables, firewalls going into the multicast translator. But yeah, scalability is a little bit the next step. But, but it works. They didn't work. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Uh, who's funding this? Uh, you mean at the AMT <laughs> level? Like who's paying for the AMT connections? Oh, the AWS translator is on my credit card right now. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, he offered to fix it many months ago and I just haven't gotten around to giving him that info yet. <laughs> I, I thought you said you were going to, you're going to help. I, I thought you were going to say you're going to help pay for it and that <laughs> it'll help remind me to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll send you my uh, crypto link. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how do I stop? Okay. Great, that's uh, pretty amazing work. And this is um, just for those uh, without the background. Um, this has been a multi-year project. Uh, it started with William Zhang uh, at Thomas Jefferson High School uh, about five years ago. He deployed the first um, uh, AMT relay. Uh, and then uh, two and a half years ago, um, Lauren, two and a half, three years ago, Lauren picked up that work uh, and has, you know, uh, she built the, the multicast menu and has extended um, and has enhanced and we're up to off net sourcing, which is something we've been talking about for years and uh, she was able to do this. So really, really impressive. And, um, and the work continues. Um, Max, uh, uh, there others have been collaborating and Max is gonna at the end talk about um, some work that his student is doing uh, in collaboration with Lauren. Um, so this is a great project um, and it's exciting. And like I said, we're, we're getting IETF back, it up, back on the M-Bone and uh, we're getting content on the M-Bone and there's lots of neat stuff. So I encourage folks, go visit uh, the multicast menu, check this out. It works, it's real. Um, you, when, you, when you receive that content, you're watching multicast streams over the M-Bone. Uh, you know, something that, you know, if we had 20 years ago, the world might be a different place, but, um, but it's pretty exciting. So um, next up is uh, Eric, you are. Hello, I am Eric from Vivo. We build software for multicasting Zoom and WebEx and other meetings. And what I wanna talk briefly about is a history of some receivers and clients as a way to think about the past and potentially inform quick multicast and other considerations. So I thought it'd be useful to just give a very, very brief you know, overview of some of the uh, things that I experienced and, um, and then some ideas about, uh, about future implementation. So next slide. So, so this is uh, some legacy receivers that you might have remembered, Starlight Networks back in 1996, bought by Pitchertel. And uh, they did MPEG-1 multicast and we built a web-based kiosk with them, very close to my heart because I met my wife at a conference when we built out a little multicast uh, 
uh, kiosk uh, using Starlight Networks. And then uh, Progressive Networks, Real Player, again, another multicast receiver, QuickTime, Windows Media, VLC, of course. Enterprise companies like VBrick had other uh, multicast receivers. And so this is thick software deployed by enterprises to receive multicast, typically um, within a very closed network, uh, typically one to 12 channels, could be an IPTV scenario, could be just a all hands meeting type scenario, very kind of internal single domain controlled environment. Um, but yeah, a range of uh, multicast receiver software. Next slide. So then it evolved a bit more, it moved into uh, taking the, uh, the Windows Media Player or Real Player uh, as, a, as a control or an SAPI plug into the browser. So wanted to get this multicast experience into the browser context so you could do interesting things about it. Then uh, Flash with the uh, Flash animation movies and eventually video um, that then provided uh, multicast capabilities from their Flash server. They had a concept called Fusion where they were blending uh, peer-to-peer -peer and uh, traditional multicast and unicast failover. Same thing with Windows Media had this concept of an NSC file where you could specify a, a unicast failover uh, mechanism. So browser context was really important at this point where uh, we want to do a lot of interactivity and other things in that browser and have it be a web experience and not just a, uh, you know, a thick client experience. Okay, next. So then um, what are we doing today? Well, um, in the context of trying to get uh, multicast video to render inside of a browser, so here's a Video.js plugin in a browser joining a live stream, the way we have to do it now, and by we, I mean there's various companies that do enterprise video like uh, High Vision, Kumu, Vbrick, uh, Kaltura, others. So these are companies that provide internal all-hands meetings and um, use cases for one-to-many video where they still want to utilize multicast in some way. So what they do is they have agent software, you could call it a, a multicast gateway, and they push that out to every single desktop and it becomes a, a web server. So they're running a localhost web server on their, their PC. Mac ends up being this kind of strange Java implementation that's pretty tricky. Um, but here you are listening on, um, uh, you know, for a, a localhost HTTPS request from a browser. And meanwhile, you can, these agents can be, uh, can be available. So when the browser makes this local HTTPS request for a service, um, it will then open up and join um, a multicast. So you could do a transport stream multicast, and then this agent would receive it. And transport stream happened to be pretty handy for HLS. So you could just take the transport stream and repackage package it into uh, HTTP HLS. TLS to the browser. So that's how you get uh, transport stream into HLS via localhost browser uh, web server into, into a local browser. And uh, lots of security problems with that, but at least it solved the problem of, of getting multicast into the browser. So we're obviously really eager for quick multicast and, and better solutions to do this. Uh, one more thing and we're almost done. So uh, last slide is, uh, is what, what is Vivo doing? So we are actually building thick clients for all the different platforms. So there's a Zoom version, Google Meet version. Uh, it has, uh, we're using VP8, it's RTP. We use Ford Air Correction. Uh, it has Chromium built into it so we can do the interactivity with Chromium. It's uh, a GStreamer uh, code base with ULPFEC and it uses QT for the, for the wrapper lots of opportunity to make this much more simple with, uh, with qu uh, uh, quick multicast. Uh, and since we have Chromium, maybe we can get to, get to that very quickly, take out the GStreamer, make this just be one interactive experience. And that would definitely make our customers a lot happier. So last slide is the, is the future. And Jake, eager to talk with you about it. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh... I just had a question. Two slides back in this deployment model where you've got a local host server. Yeah. Uh, what do you do for mobile? Or do you have uh, do you have mobile support? Because there's like sandboxing issues with this model there, right? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't support mobile. I mean, there's one option is to do a gateway in that local network, 
have that be on a Wi-Fi network and have yeah. mobile devices just join it to be unicast over Wi-Fi. All right, thanks. Um, I have a, so I've, I've heard over the years, a lot of different use cases for multicast. This is the first, this is the first time you, you've come up with a new use case. I believe it, you described it as spouse discovery. You, you multicast spouse <laughs> yes, discovery. Yes, yes, yes. Multicast I, based, um, you, 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 you actually got married as a result of multicast. That's true. That's right. That's very, yeah, I was definitely shy, but when, uh, when my wife was at the conference, I was, I had the gumption enough to go and say, check this demo out and it worked as well. So I got lucky and I've been married ever since. So I've been very lucky. That was a, that was a multicast join that's still <laughs> successful. <clears throat> uh, so I have lots of swag. If anyone wants t-shirts or mugs with multicast stuff, uh, come on down. Any other questions? <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. There's no there's no group sharing or key sharing or anything like that uh, possible. In Let's that just stick with spouse discovery. So it is. Yeah. It is. And I guess I guess that is the question. Yeah. Is uh. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. There was no there was no no group activity in that one. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Yeah. And again, if anyone's interested in shirts and mugs, I've got stuff for you. Okay, uh, Max, you're up. All right, yeah. Um, so this is just going to be quickly, um, basically. You can take as much time as you want. Yeah, you, uh, I, I see. You take us home. You, <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> you've got 30 yeah. minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, I hope I don't need 30 minutes. Uh, but yeah, so this is like just some updates on or like reporting on some of the student projects we're doing at TU Berlin related to uh, multicast. Uh, so the first one is adding IPv6 support into the VSC implementation. Um, so that's all the different ways. Uh, Jake did some testing at last at the last hackathon about the tunneling and so on. So it's that work. We're hoping to it will work here as well. So we will have IPv4 and IPv6 and so on. Um, it should be finished relatively soon. Um, the project is going to be over in like three weeks. And the last thing to do basically is we are also looking um, where well, we're going to upstream it, hopefully. And um, we're also looking for deployments. So if anybody has an IPv6 capable AMT relay somewhere or could enable AMT, uh, IPv6 on a relay somewhere, that would be great in the mbone. Um, we're still looking to serve our own relay at TU Berlin. Um, so, so it would be the Deutsche Forschungsnetz, so DFN, which is not really Jean, but connected to Jean, and it's all a bit uh, bureaucratic. And we're, we're trying to figure it out, and hopefully, we get a relay up uh, soon there as well. All right, next slide. Um, then the, the next student is. Um, implementing graceful failover for AMT, so make use of the L flag that's there, but as far as I understand it, not really used anywhere so far. And the idea is that it really sets the L flag when it's about to shut down, or it knows that it's going to shut down soon for whatever reason, and the, the gateways can start discovery, and in that way, keep the stream running and don't have any interruptions by the, the relay suddenly disappearing. Um, this is part of a bachelor thesis, so the implementation should also be done uh, in the near future. OK, uh, last slide. <laughs> Quick question. Yes. Is there an equivalent graceful restart on the client side so the AMT relay can shut down the tunnel quicker when the, it goes away so it doesn't uh, have to time out? I'm worried about, I'm worried about the relay um, encapsulating to where there's no client anymore. Uh, that's um, a good problem to solve. OK, thanks. <laughs> You know what I mean? No. If the client just drops off the air, the 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 the, the AMT gateway drops off the air, and then the, the AMT relay still has the tunnel to it, it'll keep encapsulating to it until some time out. So I just didn't want to send all the data on the network to no place, right? Right. I want it to happen sooner. So I was wondering if there's a sorry I'm going away sort of thing. When it's right. a graceful restart, not when he, it crashes or goes away. Right. 
then it would do its great. So that's the graceful mechanism. So th you're saying, Jake, there's no need for that. Okay. But yeah, uh, thanks for Jake for also coming up with that idea in a way or like um, helping the student along as well. Um, right. And since it's a bachelor field, there has to be some scientific parts. So it's going to include some measurements, hopefully, and how much time you save and so on. Yep. You yeah. Know? Actually, there is a reason. If if there's a shut, if uh, um, if something goes away, um, maybe the um, the relay can send a query sooner, so it can detect that no IGMP report is going to come back within ten seconds. You could shut down the tunnel in ten seconds instead of three minutes. That's useful. Right. Yeah. All right, and the final one is basically what um, Lauren already talked about and shown um, this update to the multicast menu. Um, I guess the interesting part here is that on, on one hand, the, the, the pulling of the uh, preview frames is going to do some measurements on how much resources that's going to take and so on. Uh, but the other thing is, how do you do like ranking for multicast streams, right? Because unlike Twitch or something, you don't have the viewer numbers. You don't know who's actually watching the stream. Um, if you have something like multicast quick, of course, you would know that, but for the multicast menu especially, there's no good way of doing that. So he implemented something like um, cache, the, 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 the same algorithm that's used for cache management, um, where you use the likes on the website to, to figure out which stream is relatively popular. Um, but yeah, there might be future work on seeing like if this also could... You know, related to telemetry and so on. But if there's a good way to figure out like which multicast stream is actually popular and is actually getting watched by a lot of people. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, yeah, so there's also the, the idea um, for a future point, but it's like a big idea. So we would need a bigger group for that. Um, maybe in the, over the, the winter term is to try to get app get distribution with multicast implemented, right? So you would popular pop, uh, popular popular um, packets would get distributed over multicast if a lot of people are requesting them at the same time. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, and that's basically it. So if any of you have ideas for similar scope topics related to multicast or just any other collaborations you would want to do, we have a lot of students um, applying for thesis. We can't, we, we don't, we can't come up with enough ideas. Um, for interesting thesis. Um, so yeah, we would be very happy if any of you have ideas or something like that. All right, thanks, Lauren. Uh, yeah, with the trending streams, is he, what is he tracking for trending streams? Just the like button? Yes, so far he, just like. So would there be any value in tracking like how many people are actually clicking to open the stream as well? Because uh, I mean, that is a button that's clicked. Right, I, I, I guess, yes. The, the idea is then, or the, the issue I guess is, um, do you like weigh them differently? But yes, it's, it's probably a good idea to like, for, for future, um, I, I can tell, yeah, thanks. Yes, and you don't know like if somebody learns from the con, so um, from the command line, you also don't, I guess, wouldn't know. If, um, yeah. Stig Van Ars, um could you track how long people actually are watching? If people, you know, just watch it for a few seconds, then they probably didn't care about it. No. If they watch a long time, they might really like it. Or... No, you can't. Okay. Yeah, that's part of the issue. I would imagine that you should be able to track, uh, one, how many people click on the uh, entry, and two, how many people could clicked on the launch in VLC. So at the yes. very least, you know how many people right. actually did click to, to mm -hmm. try to get it right, yeah right. how long they were on right if if they didn't use the command line right right for the for the second one and that's like that's why so far here's the like button because that's like more a strong indication that's actually like something they want to watch and are interested in watching um but yeah it's definitely like an i think a bigger area where you can probably come up with some clever mechanism somewhere else that uh, that you could use yeah i think the only ones who are using the command line are like the people in this room, so. They, sure, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Is, is anybody else using the multicast menu right now, right? Yeah. Other than the people in this room, so. After this yeah. meeting, it'll yeah. be a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Um, so we do have a little bit of time, uh, but that doesn't mean you can leave. Um, so uh, everybody, please, uh, feet five on floor, eyes 
eyes forward, hands folded till the end. Um, uh, but um, we have some time. Uh, anybody want to, uh, anybody have anything else they'd like to bring up uh, and discuss? Jake, are you trying to leave or are you? Uh, Okay. Uh, yes, T-shirt to here. Um, I should say, uh, like, like I mentioned, there's there's a there's a Slack group uh, that um, uh, a lot of this activity is happening on. Um, uh, reach out to me; I can get you added to the Slack group or you know any of the the, the others in this group, uh, and we can add you and get be part of the revolution. What's that? Okay, everyone. Thank you. Actually, that would be really valuable because that could prevent, in, in the past, there was like the issues with dead streams and like things, they go there and they never, you know, remember SDR had hundreds of streams that were dead so I would really like to look at six cameras for yeah, that was good. <laughs> Panda cams? Pardon me? Panda cams? Yeah, yeah exactly. Traffic cams. The Chef Farm cam. Remember Chef Farm? Yes. Wasn't that a, wasn't that a cam yeah, on the yeah. phone at one point? Was, was. The barn? I'd like to bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Now you know where to put where to put. Well, I mean, she said some different set. I like to get the detail with the park sales and contact. Well, we talked about yeah. it. This may be the number of clip cameras. Yes. When they canceled it, we had a clip live product. And I was kicking one. Don't, don't kill the product. I want to turn it into an app. Then your margins go back. Right? You're not going to have to build six cameras anymore. Everyone's going to have them in their hands. Let's turn it into an app and go. And then, you know, we're not going to have to do that. I have a story career. All right. Stay away. Thank you. Thank you. Because <laughs> it turns out it was you all along. Good point. <laughs> Master of shitty time. <laughs> Is there a medium by chance? No. I can't wear it. You're expecting engineers? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of WebEx Live. Well, there's a venting product I'm working with. That'll be a nice. Tearing their stuff out. It's cool stuff. Fantastic. This is like one of the best meeting things I've ever done. All of it's like it's happening. Yeah. Holy shit. Wait till you see this. It's live. Let me turn this one up for right. Uh, so for the folks still on, uh, we've actually, the meeting's over. So thanks for coming and we'll see you in uh, London.
that will push out in real time to understand the properties of the next stream. Yes, usually used by satellite to imagine the effect of a second way to get it, the cheaper way to get it, is over the internet. As they connect to the audience. The Yes, sure. I was at Cisco for quite some time. Okay, yeah. I had a major project of a partner called Cisco WebEx.